break, everybody. Hey, I'm Zeke. I'm, uh, I've been uh, working in about 25 years or so with uh, tr various transportation and logistics entities to uh, help them with their digitization and uh, overall technology strategies to help them meet their commercial goals. So uh, the title here of uh, what I wanted to talk with you about just for a few minutes today is that in transportation logistics revenue management, never a dull moment, why I say literally never is because you know some of us might recall when there's a big hurricane and then people are rebuilding their houses and rebuilding all the infrastructure, and then it's almost impossible, you see this in the news, it's impossible to get some trucking capacity. Um, uh, that is one example of when something's really crazy out there, but be, as I'll talk about in a couple of slides, just the normal day-to-day, -day, sort of normal, if we can call it that, operations and transportation logistics by, by nature of the industry makes it kind of a, a, a very volatile and uh, crazy set, set of operations. It makes it difficult to revenue management, uh, to revenue manage, but nevertheless, it, there is a way that we can do that. So um, these pictures here, you, so, you've seen some of these. Maybe um, you know the the one with the Union Pacific. We saw how in Los Angeles there's the the theft, and people made a big deal about that about people taking things off the trains, robbing trains. Uh, very old school. Um, Felicity Ace, all those fancy Porsches and Lamborghinis that uh, wound up at the at the bottom of the drink. And this one with the the green up there. That's the the bridge that was going over the Mississippi River. And you may a more uh, a better picture may have been showing the thousand barges that were waiting that could not go underneath that bridge because of that, that crack in the bridge and uh, DHL sliding off of the, the, the runway. And we all know about the Suez Canal, what happened there. And then, of course, our, our very friendly Prater, as they call the freighters that were from the, the passenger aircraft. So I, don't, I didn't put this, these pictures here to give everybody the case of the womp womps. It's like, you know, oh, man, what a depressing presentation. The idea here is just that I bet that if any of you are not in the transportation logistics space, you probably saw at least one of these pictures or one of these concepts, and we're familiar that there were challenges, there have been challenges in the supply chain heaped on top of what already was there with, with, with COVID. So in my couple of decades of experience, the interesting part about this is this is the first time that I feel like the, the just lay people are talking about supply chain challenges and transportation logistics around the family dinner table. That's never happened before. You, people now know about like, oh, the supply chain. I hear people talking about the, the challenges. You know, when something doesn't show up at my house on time, well, oh, there's supply chain challenges. Um, so now this isn't all bad news because when challenges occur, then that leads to innovation, right? It's a, a necessity that we have to do this. So I just grabbed this screenshot uh, from you know uh, more, uh, just last night of the type of investment, the level of investment that's coming into transportation logistics, and there's tons of money that's going into this, into the startups, and also in the innovations in uh, revenue management and uh, price and sales optimization, because we have to do this in order to maintain the health of the overall supply chain. OK, so uh, a couple of quick slides just about revenue management um, in transportation logistics. Uh, because I knew that on my, my co-panelists here were in the, the airline space, I used, this is a coronal chop. Uh, you, you can barely see the circles. This is a, a chop between a, a passenger uh, aircraft, I used airline, and a, um, and a freighter. Uh, no windows in the freighters. Um, it's just all freight in there. It's just cargo. Um, I could have had the same set of pictures here for uh, shipping, container shipping, but regardless. So to talk about what happens in air cargo, the two things, there's two things that revenue management does in air cargo. Number one is optimally assign the capacity, meaning that let's say that you're looking at your planning period the next, like the summer season for the next few months. Well, who are my customers to whom I need to contract space and say, on the Monday, Wednesday, Friday flights, you all here at you know, Panopino or Mercury Shipping, you are going to have such and such spaces in my aircraft, and that's reserved for you, and, and you're good. You don't need to worry about it. Thank you for being such a great customer. Then the free sell, or free sale, or ad hoc, as it's also called, the orange ones in my little cartoon here, is how much capacity should I reserve for that free sale, for that sort of spot type demand. This is just kind of a, a happy thing that comes along with customers and say, hey, I really need to ship something. So we have the revenue management optimization that can tell you of what that, that best breakout is. So OK, so once you have that breakout of how much we want to reserve for that pre-sale, that's one of the two things that revenue management does in transportation logistics, then you have to accept that 
optimal demand for the free sale that is overall network contributive to the maximization of your network contribution because we consider the, the variable costs in transportation logistics. So classic revenue management stuff here. Uh, my colleagues have uh, said it a few times about how you have, if you know how much capacity you have and you know what that forecast of demand is going to be and what the forward rates, what those prices are going to be, then you can optimize that. That's your objective function is, hey, I want to maximize my overall network contribution. I put, and it's a good old bid price vector, what I put over here on the right-hand side is remaining meters cubed or cubic meters and the dollars per volume. Another challenge in transportation logistics is that we care about density. In the passenger world, people don't ask me how dense I am when I'm, order when I'm getting on the flight. They've got a pretty good idea what that is and whether they can make the maximum takeoff weight. Um, but this bid price vector has a minimum replacement cost for each one of those units of capacity. You can make it as granular as you like. And if something turns up that is overall network not contributed to your optimization of your network, then guess what? Rejected. You're not going to get space on this. Thank you for your attempted booking. Please try again. Now, the problem is that in those times of, let's say, um, in the 2008 recession when, oh my gosh, you know, there was no demand coming in. So I'm going to make this little animation show that up there in your capacity, let's remember orange was the free sale. There's oodles of capacity available for free sale. So when you have an optimization, a revenue management optimization says, I got plenty of space. Somebody's going to try to make a booking. Well, what's the minimum? What's that, that hurdle rate to get in there? Whatever. Take anything. If you're going to take anything in the hull, I mean, just get it. Get a little bit of money. That's fine. So um, at those times when the, the I'll say the industry was in, in, has tanked uh, because demand has been really low, but there's still been capacity out there because maybe the passengers are still flying, um, then you have a really fancy, expensive revenue management solution that says, just take whatever. So now, does the science work? Absolutely, absolutely, for sure. But none of us would be here if we didn't believe in that, right? Um, but the, 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 the concept here, and some of my colleagues talked about this, um, uh, Eric did about the, the two aspects of, in, in an airline, there'd be the pricing and the revenue management. In those times when there is low demand and there's plenty of capacity and you get some system that says just take anything, even if you have just one little container on one of your flights, let's say, but if you have the pricing aspect of that, it can sort of turn that dial to make sure that you get the maximum of the willingness to pay from that customer. So now, in times of COVID, the pricing has been famously volatile. Let's stick, taking a step away from the airline example, um, we've probably heard about the, the shipping containers, the 40-foot equivalents, 20-foot equivalents from container shipping, how it's now thousands of dollars that previously was not at that level because of the supply chain bullwhip effect. And um, so what carriers have been realizing is we really need to do something about the pricing, being able to very quickly manage, manipulate, maintain, and share with the space updated pricing. Rather than updating that every, whatever, month, maybe once a year, we've got to update that almost in real time. Uh, so I'm going to show just a couple of quick slides here about some uh, air cargo carriers who were ahead of the curve. Um, the first one is Lufthansa Cargo, and I'm going to say that they had great foresight or, and or got lucky with what they were doing in their innovation scheme. Through They have their own AI machine learning algorithms for providing spot prices for the capacity for the spot deals. They said, I don't want any of my humans talking with other humans for just a little onesie twosie spot deal. I want my humans talking about the big deals with the big freight forwarders. They're gonna last for months. And so if somebody has a spot deal, they want a little space on, the, on, on one of our aircraft, I want the computer to deal with that, put out a price that that customer is gonna say yes to and just be done with it. No humans involved with that. And very, very successful that. This is Dorothea von Boxburg. She's the, the chief cargo officer at Lufthansa Cargo. And they, they call it the rapid rate response, triple R, and they happen to be ahead of the game on this for the times of COVID. And on their online sales, which is how they, the, their customers interact with that computer, double digit growth. So it worked out really, really well for them. Um, they got a bunch of smart people there who are doing these AI ML type of algorithms on their own, and it, and it worked. Cargo Lux is an all cargo, um, uh, is, they run a freighter network. No windows on their planes, all cargo, no passengers. And um, well, LEAP, uh, it's almost jargon, is the leading profits. It's what they called their, their project to deploy this pricing technology of being able very, very quick to manipulate their prices and, and update that. And it's been very successful for them, where they have the pricing solution to be able to um, update the prices based off the volatility and then put that in the, in the form of a quote uh, to their customer. And they're getting 100% um, um, 
response, good response from their customers on this real-time quoting. So okay, those are just a couple of examples on the pricing side, but back to the lecture at hand, this is about revenue management here today. So um, what I'm going to show you is just a, a, a pictogram, again, this little cartoon that I made for a white paper that I, I, I wrote for pros a, a couple of years ago, where I say that if, if you have revenue management and pricing, then you never make a mistake. Okay, so I'll show you some curvy lines here that's about for a particular customer's willingness to pay. Um, and then the bottom line, this dashed red line, is the hurdle rate or the bid price of what is that opportunity cost that comes out of the revenue management. So in the times of when there is a, um, plenty of capacity like uh, and not that much demand, your hurdle rate's gonna be essentially zilch or really it's you know just your, your variable costs, then but that customer who might have access to that capacity, why charge it at you know $1.50 if that's what you just happen to publish when that customer might be willing to pay $1.74? So that this first block here shows that incremental value. And the one, uh, well, let's see if my laser is going to go over here and over here, is that incremental value of, hey, I know what this customer's willingness to pay is. Um, and so adding that in the revenue management, whereas the revenue management system would have just said, just take whatever, right? Um, then the opposite solution, or the opposite side of this, is where up here, this customer, these wavy lines of that customer saying, you know, they're, in my example, they're willing to pay $1.75, but by golly, the revenue management system says, demand is screaming right now, they gotta pay three bucks, so I'm sorry, Acme, I gotta reserve this space, you don't have access to that. So when you have both revenue management and the pricing, then it's sort of like you never make a mistake if, uh, in the ideal world. So. With transportation logistics, now this is another womp womp slide and it's very boring, it's just uh, text and bullets here, but I wanted to talk about some of the, uh, the challenges about what makes that hard to provide for revenue management and transportation logistics. So number one, a short booking window. So in, uh, we, uh, Lori had the, the presentation of, on the passenger side that you know, 80-day uh, lead up time for bookings on the passenger side went to I think 30 or something like that. 30 is day rigueur for cargo. Most of those booking windows, rather than being 360 days out for passenger and cargo, it's either 30, sometimes 20, sometimes 10 days. Some carriers say just 10 days, and that's it. So you don't have a lot of time to course correct in a revenue management aspect when you don't have a lot of time even to make a booking for your customers to make that booking. There's a very steep booking curve near departure. Again, this, we could talk about trucking, we could talk about intermodal, we could talk about ocean container freight. Right now, let's talk about air cargo. 90% of those bookings come in the last day or two, right before departure, if you're lucky. So it's a very, very steep booking curve. Doesn't mean that there's not a booking curve just because it's short and it's steep, but it makes for those challenges so the humans have a hard time to adapt um, with what might be changing the volatility. Booking versus actual tendered, there's a discrepancy of that. And this is kind of a, this is something that is unique to transportation logistics, is <laughs> someone makes a booking, for the, they say, I need some space on your, on your flight, please, great. I, now you have a booking as a carrier. That, the booking is a rumor compared to what is actually going to turn up. If, if, if they, there's the, the chronic problem, the challenge of a big customer says, look, I booked 500 kilos. They show up with 1,500. Or they show up with 130. It's huge volatility, a huge discrepancy. It's, I mean, imagine this the next time you're boarding your next flight. If you say, hey, my cousin decided uh, that she wanted to come with me to uh, this event, so you're cool if she just grabs a seat, right? And then you both just trot onto the plane. It would never happen. But in the cargo space, there's set, there are these relatively fewer number of great, big, really powerful customers. So the airlines say, OK, we're going to figure it out if we have to offload somebody else or do something. Um, Volatility in, in demand, hey, if the tulips in Holland blo uh, bloom a couple of days earlier or later than what you were anticipating, then you got to get a charter. Or you got to deal, you got to deal with that in real time in some way. There's really high vo volatility in that demand, which makes demand forecasting has been an ongoing challenge. And I'll talk about that in one second about some of the things that we've done in uh, machine learning to deal with that. Um, uncertain capacity. Uh, interesting that you know on the passenger side you have a pretty good idea even though if it's, it's messed up in the times of COVID but you got a pretty good idea about how many seats you're gonna have because you're the one making the decision on what kind of aircraft you're gonna uh, put on a route in cargo you kind of get what's left over uh, if it's on a belly capacity of a passenger uh, flight where hey this is how much how much baggage is going to be on there I have a forecast of that and then here's the dregs 
So there is, you have to make an estimate of that as well. And if we think about, um, I mentioned intermodal and trucking, and even in the rental car space, there's um, the directional imbalance. Uh, in, in the trucking world, uh, we call that uh, hauling air freight on the backhaul. If you have you know, something that goes into one of those uh, zones where there's a manufacturing area into where there's consumers, and then that driver is going to haul air freight back and not generate any revenue with that asset, that's a big problem. And the revenue management, the network optimizations need to take that into account. Um, because as Michael was saying, you know, profit is key. Profit is the future of revenue management, where we all need to go. And the boom or bust, like we talked about, you know, 2008, where things tanked um, in, the, in SARS, Cargo was, was the hero, uh, right? Um, where, uh, um, as uh, Eric was saying, that we had um, flying to, um, to Australia, at least there's some cargo in there. You know, we got 30 guys in the Dreamliner up on the top, but at least there's some cargo generating some revenue. So it's boom or bust. It's sort of you're the, the god of the goat in, in the cargo space. So, all right, I'm going to move on here. There's to give sort of two perspectives on um, some of the solutions from technology vendors in the space. So COTS is commercial off the shelf is what that is, um, where you have, there is a solution and yeah, you can configure that uh, as the case may be. And then there's the custom solutions. And this is the age old buy versus build. Um, uh, whether you want to build yourself or use a, a, a provider who can build for you. But first off, the COTS uh, commercial off the shelf. Full credit to uh, the folks at Pros here. And Lori, this is from her Aggie Furs event. I took a screenshot with my, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Eski Aaron, her picture up there just so that she gets full credit for this, um, for the Diane Revenue Management, as my team is calling it, uh, for its direct adaptive neural network, where in cargo is the first place that we've been applying this because there are such great shocks to the system. There's that huge volatility that I was talking about, the demand. It's really hard. And there has to be something that in more real time deals with those changes in your demand. Well, what this, the, the, the effect or the so what of that, of what this Diane is going to be doing with this neural network is, is taking more of a snapshot in real time of what that, the most recent historical data. So rather than looking back historically, you know, what we would always do is to look at two years and get the, um, get the seasonality curves. It's looking at what has been occurring more recently and through that faster learning loop with the response variables can provide an estimate of what that opportunity cost, what the replacement cost is of those units of capacity. So sort of a, a addressing that volatility head on. Um, okay, so commercial off the shelf, that's some of the things that are being done right now with AI and ML to uh, apply that to the revenue management concepts. And then there is um, uh, the, the custom uh, option, which I have a, a friend at uh, Kaizen Analytics, this is their logo up there, and this is uh, some folks who um, uh, um, broke off of the, the revenue analytics, um, uh, Robert Cross, you, some of you might be familiar. So Kaizen Analytics does the custom uh, solutions. and. If we look at this through a cargo lens, thinking about, well, gosh, all these cargo carriers are making more money than they've ever made, literally, because it's great times for cargo, great rates out there, really low capacity, which is a pretty good situation if you're trying to be really profitable. The thing is, it can be very frustrating because, by golly, the, the, um, the, the, the passenger still makes the vast majority of the revenue. So budgets can be hard to come by for technology investments and for innovations. So, Wrapping this up then, <laughs> the, uh, um, uh, the idea here is there's so many different aspects of revenue management that you can pick up on, that you can apply. So find what is the highest value and bolt that on through a custom solution. And this is just the last slide here from, uh, from Kaizen, is that there's this maturity curve, and if there's some part of those aspects where you feel like you really are lacking, that you can get a lot of value from, do that first. Okay. Last slide, and then I'll have a call to action I would like from this audience. Um, this is a, a, another cross-section of A380, just because it illustrates the point. Up at the top here, we have our folks in blue who are our Microsoft and our Accenture executives who are flying in business class, and they're on a negotiated agency type of contract with the carrier. Down on the bottom is the cargo in the belly, also negotiated sort of continuous pricing in those regards because you can discount for the passengers off of those agency uh, contracts and for cargo you certainly can discount or you can negotiate and price as you like 
And as here, the hoi polloi in the orange in the middle, the rest of us who are subject to this, these revenue management solutions that open and close those fair classes, open and close those capacities, then what we're finding is that with that, it's kind of interesting. I find that this, this is one area where the cargo um, and the B2B aspect, we see that the passenger revenue management is now talking about continuous pricing. And it's kind of turning that, I just made this the kind of similar color to say it's kind of like coming toward a convergence and the holy grail is someday we're going to have where every flight, the entire flight in a holistic way is revenue managed where cargo and passengers are both competing for that maximum takeoff weight of who's going to get on the flight and maybe we would turn away some passengers if there's some really valuable like live lobsters or something like that that you have to ship down to the bottom. So, okay, this is my last uh, slide. I'm just, this is a call for, for uh, to all of us here in the room is um, what we historically have, have found is, you know, when, when folks say, okay, what are the results? Most of the operational groups within a, a, a carrier can give you a pretty good idea of what their, their value, their value add for the, um, for the organization has been. And then cargo revenue management says, well, you know, this, she's thinking the head of, of revenue management here, she's thinking, well, I kind of need a parallel alternate universe going on at the same time to be able to tell you what would have happened if I didn't have what, um, what, what I do have, which is just reality. And I know that it's providing value. And there's been a lot of work done in this, like Peter Bellababa here with the, uh, not here, but with the MIT uh, pods, passenger OND simulator. Um, so this is my call for on the cargo side of things also to have, especially because supply chain is so important and now people are realizing this, is can we have a customer value, customer value management? This is fresh stuff that Gartner now is starting to realize customer value management is a thing where the customer who invests in technology needs to be able to quantify that. I have a, 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 someone who used to be on my team reporting to me, he started his own company, Kuvama, Customer Value Management is what that stands for, just to help with these types of technologies. But an open call to these, to uh, all of us here in the room to think about that, if there's a good way that we can come up with some smart methods of having a standardized way to value these technologies. Thank you.